that night as we dress to come to the bridge to clear the bridge it was black dark it was dark it wasn't funny the guy my friend from Nima say me hello told me Joe we are eight and the people are 56 at the border probably you and I got 24 less than 24 hours to live but the kind of training I just done I, I, I didn't let says joke to frighten me then I had my little bottle of uh, some share lunar rum they call Sasma I said say the thing you're talking could be true let me drink a little bit of Sasma so probably when the bullet touch me at least you know it will, it will reduce the pain so I took my Sasma and we started maneuvering towards the bridge eight of us when we got on the bridge there was a guy an AFL soldier we didn't see him well, immediately on the bridge we passed by him almost eight of us but Lawrence Wales of the AFL orchestra spotted a man behind us we are all taking prone position we are drawn our plane the plane was drawn by Jimmy Bia himself how to position ourselves and divide our firing sectors into different sectors. Jimmy Bia, Kupotier was able to take care, destroy the communication set at the immigration place. Go on the Monrovia Highway. Take uh, take defensive position there and make sure nobody comes to the bridge while we are trying to bust the lag to open the gate. Say me Lord, Anthony McQueen and myself were placed right on the bridge with Emmanuel Dennis and Charles Kamara. And there were a few uh, 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 Sierra Leonean guys that were recruited from Freetown. But all of us had on bulletproof vests. The family bought a bulletproof vest with reinforced steel plates. So Lauren will spotted the AFL guy on the bridge. I want to go into detail on this particular issue because it has been a controversial thing. People are misquoted, me and other people. In sometime during the propaganda war, even the death of Jimmy Bia was cited that I killed Jimmy Bia by Tom Wu, you and all that. So I have to go into, and you have to bear with me, I gotta go into the minute details of it. Because it was a firefight. So when Lauren Wills and the AFL guys spotted each other, the M16 in the hands of the AFL guy was already advanced when he saw us coming. But he was too afraid to shoot. So he and Wills grabbed each other. One hand holding a rifle, and the other two hands holding their uniforms. And they were too tight, the rifles were too long for any of them to shoot each other. So they were fighting. As they were fighting, the AFL guy on the government side now, a, a gun went off. And two red hot bullets flew over Pe Mialo and myself. I said, say, he said yes. I said, man, those guys will kill us. He said, I said, I said you don't see how they are fighting and they are shooting? If anybody stand now, you are dead. And as they fought, the morning said so nobody wanted to leave each other the, the guns still started firing so i said no these guys will not spoil this operation i went in prone position and opened fire on two of them they all they all went down three rounds but as a sharpshooter i knew which side my comrade was and the three rounds brought down the intended target plus Will then Will got up and said Joe that you shoot I said yeah I, sh I shot them he said oh thank God I said you hurt he said no I said okay then stay down he went back down 
somebody started sawing. They brought a big truck. Robert Phillips was at the bridge. He sent the truck with one Mandingo boy in it. But when the first round, the first few shots went off, this Mandingo kid took off in the swamp like somebody running at the Olympics. The boy got scared and left us. He ran in the bush. So the car was without driver. Just then, another AFL soldier came and started firing. Who to that gate? Who saw in the gate? And you might then they say, yes, come that us. You said, no, why are you doing saw in the gate? What the truck doing at the gate? But that was the normal question any body would ask. The soldier kept coming and making his threats. And for some strange reason, I just can't believe why he didn't fire the one tire on the car. He just needed one round to wreck the entire operation. Because that was our only car. But for some strange reason, he was firing in the air. Not knowing why the soldier was firing in the air, Jimmy Bia being a sound military man, thought that his area leaked. You know, in military struggle, when you're on a battlefront leak, you got problems, you need help. So Jimmy, instead of firing at the guy when he might have done it, gave the order, he started creeping behind the man who was threatening. We who were in prone position could not see them across the road. So when the man's voice got closer to me, and Emmanuel Dennis kept yelling, anybody who can see that man, shoot him. I believe Jimmy Bia should have shot the man. But apparently, Maybe he wanted to catch the man with his hands or something. He was probably close to the man. And then, when Joe Wally anger kicked in, I said, Why are the men ordering? To? I took one of the hammer like Chinese grenades from my pocket. They issued each person two. I took three more. I said, This is a do or die mission. I don't know what's going to happen. So I could afford to use one. So as the man was speaking, threatening, I was watching for his voice. Because you couldn't see anybody even six feet away from you. You would see them either as a shadow. I lobbed the grenade across the road to where the man's voice was. And it went off. The next thing I know, I saw someone in a short position coming towards me. That's when I opened fire with three more rounds on his chest. He dropped and immediately he woke up. So, you know, when you go into military battles, sometimes you, when they, they plan the way you plan it, you can't go like that. I was wondering, in seconds, how would I shoot somebody in the chair? He just woke up. It escaped me that the man had on a bulletproof vest. So when the man woke up, Lauren Wales, who was standing a few feet on my side, said, oh, the man died. And how Lauren will open fire, the bullet hit. Jimmy Bia in the neck. And Jimmy Bia dropped. At this time, we did not even know it was Jimmy Bia. We thought it was the guy who was making the noise, saying that you were going to spoil the car. So, when we brought the flashlight, it was Jimmy. He might Dennis say, put the man in the car. I said, Dennis, most of these guys just ate with Jimmy a few hours ago. If you put Jimmy in the car with Guru Manuva, we really spoil their morale. So our best bet is let's put him somewhere when they think are see tomorrow. We'll come back for him and give him a nice decent burial. He said, yes, that's true, Joe. But I want to fire a few rounds in the air. I said, at what? Naturally, I started detecting to my commander. Because I, I didn't think that it was necessary to shoot again. Bia was dead, and we had to take the truck across, put the ammo inside, and go and reach Monrovia before 5 o'clock to start this thing. So we saw the gate open, the car went, brought the arm, and Kuomba came and 
saw the first guy who died at the bridge, who and uh, Lauren Will were fighting. He poked his head out of the window and said, Joe, the man died. I said, Chief, yeah, the man died. He said, Amen. When he said, Amen, I was like, What? General, you say, Amen, one man died. <laughs> How can <laughs> the general say, Amen? So I say, Oh, we're in trouble. So we put our things and started going. When we got at Medina, I mean, all the gates were opening. I think uh, James Holder and Harry Greece did a great job. Whether they bribed the people not to come or to open the gates, the gates were open. Nobody, any gate we reached was open. Probably the grenade sound drove everybody. When we got at Medina, Harry Greaves. Charles Kamar, a few officers went into the offices of Daewoo, the people that were buried in the road. Mr. Commissioner, I'm sorry, I'm talking from my memory. I'm not talking to by this text anymore. So if I skip anything, you know that in the question and answer period, please let me know. I'm not trying to. And the man. All their cars were filled with gas and everything. The jeeps were ready. Because they were company cars. Before they parked the cars, they filled them. Somebody gave us that information. And the Korean men wanted to be hesitant. I think one of the Sierra Leonean guys put a gun butt in his mouth. I think he was probably glad to give the keys. After that, we took more than 15 cars. We developed ourselves into groups. Cooper Tier headed a group to the mansion. Uh, Charles Kamara, Harry Grease was his driver. They were in a group to take over the radio station. Uh, James Woodall was driving uh, Kuomwa. And as we approach the AU gate, we saw a bunch of security people and soldiers, and probably they thought. We were coming from Bombay Hills, from the headquarters of the 1st Battalion, because we were neatly dressed in camouflage that family bought from the States when he brought uh, the, life, the, 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 the bulletproof uh, jackets. So they thought we were regular Liberian soldiers. So they allowed, it, they allowed us to pass. But even if, uh, if they had not allowed us to pass, we had enough firepower at that time to pull those our way through. But they allowed us to pass. We separated the groups. Charles Kamara went to the radio station through by way of Freeport to go to uh, ERBC. Cooper Tier myself went towards Jalatan, we climbed the LU steps. I said, this is the same LU that the people fired me on. Now I'm going to stay LU here and open the first fire. I launch from right on campus, I launched the first RPG bomb at the mansion. They didn't turn around now, we were trying to democratize arms now. People fire at us when we're student now, I'm a student, 10 years in college, I'm buying. And then the firing started. However, the only thing I know about the capture on the radio station was that the Charles Kamara told me this, if you lie, I'm lying. Harry Greaves put on the high beams of the car he was driving, flashing in the eyes of the, to blind the eyes of the security people at the radio station. And the soldier asked, who is flashing that car light in our eyes? And someone in the car, probably Harry Greaves, and said, oh, we miss our way. We're trying to find our way. Just as they were talking, the bomb went off. It took out the whole guard post. The security people at that place put down all their arms. And they said, we were here. We were here. They didn't wear a fire just now that cool. We were here. That 
That's how they talk about the radio station. Cooper T and I continue advancing. Cooper T should have covered the, the, the entrance of the mansion around the, um, the information ministry. I was covering the other side of the foreign ministry way. The guy who had our logistics, the additional weapons to reload in case we run out, he came through Jalatown by St. Patrick's, and when he approached us, our commander panicked. He might then say, well, who bring in our car? And told a body guy, open fire, fire at our own man. For the second time in the night, we fire at our own man. Then I told him, but we told that boy who was driving the car to come. It was another Madinga boy that Hoda and her Grease brought. Why you fired the boy? You were bringing the luggage. He said, oh, I didn't know, Joe. Before I knew, Cooper Tier left. They saw on the information ministry and started coming to me. So we pushed deep behind the mansion, Cooper Tier and myself. And I asked Cooper Tier, where is the arm room? You been in this army. Where is the arm room? I said, the first thing you want to catch in this mansion is the arm room. He said, the thing way beyond there. As we were going, some AFL officers from the executive mansion guard battalion came up. They challenged us. That time, it was, around, it was going to six, like that. And you know, in Liberia, by six o'clock, it's still a little dark. So we couldn't see each other, but we could see people in the distance. So we went in prone position of Sierra Leone and Borka for Malady and myself. Behind the mansion. Cooper Tier stayed in the back. I told him, go and cover your assignment. This is my assignment. The left side of this place is my assignment. The right side is your assignment. And don't shoot behind me. Go on your assignment. So Cooper left. Then the, 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 the executive mansion guard battalion opened fire on us. Now they were ready to fight. And formality was laying by me and said, Joe, I said yes. He had just went like that, he was there. And when I, he, he turned to me and said, Joe, I saw a hole in his face. The M16 round that these guys were firing. As we bent down, we had on steel helmets, but for some strange reason, a few inches below the steel hel helmet, the bullet hit formality. He dropped and died beside me. And the guys were coming towards me. And please, you can say I believe in superstition or not. I opened fire with that machine gun in prone position and the guys were still walking towards me. They didn't stop. So they were in a distance and I thought they were about to seize me bodily. I told the guy beside me, I said, give me that RPG ball. This thing, maybe they got gun proof. One thing they got bomb proof. And I'm not going to let nobody catch me tonight. It's not going to happen. I fire one RPG round. And the soldier's foot was the only thing I saw flying. So I had to retreat. When I retreated, we ran out of our first basic load. The car that was bringing our logistics got fired on. So I said, my man, what are we doing? He married Dennis. Well, I look, Cooper Tia left me in the mansion and went down with us. The AFL officers that came in support of the coup, instead of helping us to consolidate the coup, the Labyrinth Pool left picking job when the thing had not consolidated. They started grabbing job, going in offices and sitting down and saying, that I'm this one, I'm this, that, I'm that. They're taking job while the thing was still. Volatile. So I asked them, where is Kwamba? 
He said, he's in a barrack. I said, what is he doing in a barrack? I thought James Hodor said he was going to be at a safe place in town. Instead of the barracks. Anybody could, have, could shoot him. So I ran to the barracks. Where I went, I met Kuomba, Tuba, some big airfare officers talking. So I called him on the side. I said, Chief, what are you doing here? Anybody can take a book shot at you. You are not safe. He said, okay, Joe. What do you want me to do? I said, there's a war tank right at the APC guy inside. The guy in the APC. The APC driver pulled off. A few guys from the AFL sat. And as we drove towards Benson Street, we saw a huge group of AFL people. Probably they are going to the arsenal to collect weapons. So, as we went through them, one of them saw and recognized Kuomba. Half of his body was in the APC. I turned my bike. All the other guys that came to join us were facing the back of the APC. And this guy opened fire with the entire 30 rounds in the M16. And I felt sounds on my bike. Then I felt pain right on my butt. The guy who was facing the shooter, all in his groans, he must have taken more than 10 bullets. I put my head on Kuomba's, I put my hand on Kuomba's head and pressed him down into the APC. I'm still being a good soldier here trying to protect my chief. So we, the man who was hit, the guys who were hit, they started crying. And this man, there was one guy who was crying. I could not understand Gil. But this man was feeling so much pain. He was crying in his dialect to the point where I could not ignore his cry. He said, Chief, take me to the hospital. Kuomba, when we got in front of civil defense, Kuomba got down. And ran upstairs. I said, where is he going? Call one or two of the Sierra Leone boys. I said, go behind the chief. So they went up. I told the APC to drive on Broad Street. The man went on Broad Street and stopped. I saw a lady coming in the car. A Lebanese, Middle Eastern looking lady. You know, nicely dressed. One of the soldiers with me stopped the car. Politely got down. The guy told her we want the car to take somebody to the hospital. She said, okay. She got down. We put the wounded in there, sent them to JFK. The next car we saw coming was Paul Moba. Paul Moba came in a brand new Peugeot. So my bodyguard that day, he made himself my bodyguard. Another sapo man called Apollo Jeswen. He said, Chief, we're taking a car from the man. I said, Yeah. Then the other guy said, But fire the man. If the man won't get out of the car because Paul Mobile tried to try to resist. This guy, this is my property, man. What are you guys doing? You came for a door. <laughs> so they wanted to shoot. And I said, No. You can't shoot him. You want the car? Take the car. But this man is a civilian. You can't shoot him. Paul Moriba got out of the car. Gave us the key. And we drove straight to Grady Allison House. The defense minister. Who jailed my, my sister who I delivered one week before. At NSA. I said, this, I got to meet Grady Allison. I got to run it with him. I went to his house and Grady Allison took a boat and fled. He was gone. Few soldiers were hanging around his house. His wife and their, I think two or three beautiful daughters were standing there. So I said, where is this by Jero Key? The defense minister car. Because for some strange reason, I didn't feel good riding for a mobile car. 
Number one, it was not big. Number two, it was looted. But this one, the government car, they by general the government car, we take it legitimate. So the girl who was holding the key, Alice's daughter, said no, and I gave him Papa car key. So, Madam Wat Water Allison, peace be unto her soul, said, My child, the young man came here, he didn't fire around, he didn't beat anybody, he didn't shoot any of us, he wouldn't ask for a government car, get him in a uh, car key. She screamed, Our daughter. So she brought a key. When she got closer to me, she said, What's your name? She said, My name is Joe Wiley. She said, oh, you the Joe Wiley man? I said, yes. She said, wow, I didn't know you were that handsome. I thought you were some kind of bad looking man. So I said, I'm not here for that. <laughs> I mean, I was probably like 26, 27 years old. And I was looking better than I'm looking now. You know, after toting the problem of your country for more than 20 years, I got gray over time, and probably I'm now suffering from premature old age. So she told me, I didn't know you were that handsome. We got the car. Apollo just went, ran into Alice's room and got a brown grape. I think some money was in the grape. It wasn't much. Bust the grape open. He said, Chief, I'm keeping a grape for you. Allah, you are not keeping a grape. I never saw that grape again. <laughs> Apologies when we're leaving Allison's house. No, first, we're leaving Allison's house. Then I went, I stopped at Dr. Sawyer's house. You know, naively, thinking that he will embrace me. Sawyer was not there, according to the security, but I knew he was there. You know? So Kofa came out and said, the chief now here, I said, yeah, Kofa, get in the car. I asked for a glass of water and I drank. I said, my friend, take me, let me go see my daughter. My daughter was one more old Tina. When I left, I went to Purple Beach. Just as I was holding my daughter, somebody came to me and said, Chief, go back in power. There was an announcement just now in the radio, I mean, on the radio in the car. So, leader, baby, let's go. So, I kissed my daughter and gave, gave, her, to my, gave her back to my brother and left. When I got in town, I thought Kuomba had gone back to the barracks. But I should have been killed during the, the coup. If I were riding a different car, it's the minister's car that saved my life. As I enter the gate, I think around two or three, going to four, BBC gate, I saw all the soldiers, though were speaking on the air, and I was still looking for Kuomba. I'm this guy, I came from a political background where I have to be thorough and committed. I couldn't leave the street if I didn't see the chief. I went all the way to brigade. And everybody kept saluting me, thinking that it was Grady Allison that was coming in a jeep because they knew the jeep was the defense minister's jeep. But when I passed and they see my red naked chair that Famula gave me, and the uniform I had on, they knew it was not Grady Allison, but it was late. I went straight through motor pool. I called my own son. I said, I saw enemies. <laughs> I said, I saw enemies looking at me. They wouldn't think I saved me at the minister car. I drove straight on the bypass. And I told Apollo Jason, take this car and go. He said, Chi, where will you be? I said, look at this fool. I will show you where I'm going to be when they catch you, so you bring me there. But well, I said that in my heart. I said I will be 
you know, how should they house here? Yeah, the other house are behind and I hear the other one behind. <laughs> when he left, I went in the opposite direction across the road and went down the hole. Took out my uniform. The cabinet list. And most of the people in the cabinet had to tell me thank you. They didn't die because I had a list. Because the list of the military appointee well, was with Kuomba and his boys. But the cabinet list, I insisted that I'm the only civilian lawyer. I came from the university. When it comes to civilian cabinet, let me hold a list here. Yeah? On that list, I don't remember who all names were on that list now, but I know that the finance minister designate if the coup associated was Madame Salib. I was sitting president today. Not President Salib, Madame Salib at that time. I tore the list up and threw it in the Doo River. Took my AK-47, put it under my pillow because I said, why in Hardy when it come, the cold room will be right in this room. I ain't going nowhere. I slept good. The very next day, my friend and myself walked politely across the bridge. They were searching cars, we were sucking oranges going, and we passed by all the checkpoints. And I went to a lady's house. They called the lady Mama. She was related to the Comans. Because if I went to my sister's house, I know that would be the first place the security would look. So I went to this lady's house. She said, don't go to your sister's house. Stay here. I stayed with her. The next day, I made my way straight towards Gunnersville. The chief electrician at the executive mansion, I was dating his daughter. I went to his house. The old man saw me. He panicked. He said, my son, they're killing people. They're killing people. Don't be in my house, my son. I beg you, they're killing people. So his wife said, so you want to tell me we have been knowing this boy forever? He come to our house. You want to go in outside because they're killing. Let them kill all of us. But he ain't going nowhere. The woman put her foot down. The woman said, this, Joe not living there. If we put him on the street, they will kill him. I can't live with that. Preferably, let him come and kill all of us. After two days, I left. I went to Banovich. I think LPRC fans somewhere there. And I slept in an outside bathroom because it was dark when I got there. I saw people coming, patrol cars, I was in an outside bathroom. The rain was beating me, but I wanted to survive. When it did broke, I went straight to Ray Line. Took a taxi, straight to where the plane uh, 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 When I got at the Salala Gate, a friend of mine who and I went to Charlotte Turbo Memorial Academy was in the immigration. He spotted me. Because the man asked me, y'all get down. They were putting people down online. I got on the line. And when I reached this guy, he looked at me for long. Security officer. He said, what's your name, my friend? I said, my name is Steven. Steven who? Steven Sabi. Say, where, where are you from? You wish try. I say, a crew. Say, can you speak crew? There was something suspicious about me. He said, can you speak crew? I said, yes. So he spoke crew, and I replied. He said, well, okay. So, but as I left the immigration checkpoint because the car was parked way off, Entering the car, somebody stood beside a man who knew me as Stevie and said, Joe. I said, Damn. 
I look back, I recognize the guy. I just jumped straight in the car, and the car pulled off. I was thinking that they were going to chase me. But probably the, the officer was looking at the next car and probably was screening the other group of people. So they didn't come after me. I managed and got in Freetown. From Freetown, I stayed. Sylvester Moses sent agents. Because you know Sylvester Moses uh, was uh, one of those guys who grew up in Freetown. So he had agents there. One day, the beautiful looking Liberian Linga Franca speaking woman came to my place. Kuomba had paid for this place. White Pole building, Wilkinson Street. You know, you press button, the hot water, everything was to do, man. And Archie William and them were bringing the money from America, so they were, we were not living in cheap places. You know, according to Super Bowl Rebel Business, it's big business. The woman asked me, you poor are Liberians? I said, yes. You know, I didn't take it to be anything. The next thing I know, I got a call. Somebody came and said, you people got to vacate. I said, why? See, the Liberian government claim that they have identified you guys. And if you and, and the Sierra Leone government has denied. But if you guys don't leave, they will grab you. They are coming to search 7 o'clock. We took all our things, went somewhere else. And I came back. I was always curious. I wanted to know who was coming to look for me. Seven o'clock shop, Sylvester Moses, with the Sierra Luna security, came to our apartment. I saw them climbing upstairs, and I said, oh, it's Sylvester Moses. They, they think Syria, I got to get out of Freetown. Somehow, family managed to find me a ticket. And because I didn't have any proper travel document, so I went through the back door and got a Sierra Luna travel document at, as Joseph Kamara. So Joseph Kamara was going to Ghana. That's how I flew in December, I think December, early January. And went to Freetown. 